Hi all, this is my round 9 game against Gary Quillen, who I managed to lose to last year as well in the final round of the British. So, I'm <laughs> becoming his regular victim. Anyway, he's a very good player, and um, he recently did achieve the IM title by doing well in Cannes immediately after the Gibraltar. Um, I think that was this year's uh, Gibraltar, so after, and he drew over 2700 in this year's Gibraltar, which is maybe a game I'll show in, in the next video actually. That was very good, amazing, you know, tactic he played there at one point. Um, yeah, Gary Quillen is one of the crop of juniors, um, you know, who are around my age, and when I had won the Lloyds under 18 back in 1989, this crop of juniors were over like 200 ECF, and I, I'd got an ECF, you know, boost as a result of some tournaments, but these guys were over 200. We're talking like he the Hennigan and, and Quillen, about the same age as me. And you got Summerskell, Motazavi, Norwood. Um, you had other, other juniors like David Sands, Vukovic. You know, I played all these guys, you know, in juniors ages ago. You know, back in back in '89. You know, that kind of period. Um, and many of them became titled players. Um, Philip Tozer was there. His brother was also around that same age group. And apparently, uh, Richard Tozer had won a junior tournament, which had all of them in in it. But uh, this this group of juniors also played this simultaneous against uh, Kasparov once. And um, I think it was a clock simultaneous, and Scott apparently was getting quite annoyed, according to uh, someone, someone who mentioned uh, that to me. Um, uh, so, so anyway, so Quillen, yeah, he's been brilliant for ages, even since you know 1989, he's been over 200. So he's, he's playing white against me, and um, I played this Morozovic system, Bishop E7, and he plays E5, and I'm thinking... Actually, why can't I just go for the F5 square? And I think I did see this in chess games, com, knight h6. And I think it's good statistically for black um, after this. Uh, but he plays knight b3, not bishop d3. And the instructive point about this video, I think I'm going to call it strategic complacency, because uh, I think um, Gary was saying in the, in the pub after, you know, that would be a good um, thing to learn from it, you know, not to be so complacent, just because you exchange off the light square bishops and secure f5 doesn't mean the game's over by far especially if i think the opponent has strategic pawn breaks available you've still got to lock those down you've still got to lock down your king safety as well so perhaps there was a bit of complacency that crept in to this game by achieving some strategic objectives but only a subset of what's required to win the game and definitely not to lose it so we'll see how the game evolves bishop d3 bishop Sorry, knight f5, bishop d3. There's a potential risk he's just going to take. And maybe, you know, this kind of stuff against d5 and against the pawn on h5, if I'm not careful. Um, as well as the queen coming to f3. So I was a bit wary not to play this too stereotypically. So after h5, he plays actually c3. Again, not committing this knight. Reinforcing his pawn chain. And still discouraging c5. Now, there's an interesting point about this knight b3 and c3. Um, if black is discouraged from playing c5 and fixing a pawn on d4, that means that this pawn is a potentially winning pawn later on if black never plays for c5, because later white could have this pawn break c4. And I think this is a very important idea to identify, this delaying of c4. So, as though black's tempted not to play this plan c5, takes d4, fixing that c3 pawn. So, be aware of this, that there's some venom, latent venom, in this setup with knight b3. Not only preventing c5, it means that the c pawn has got latent potential. So, bear that in mind for later in this game. b6, so I'm trying to play my first strategic goal, exchange off the light square bishop, so reinforcing the light squares generally. These two come to mind, but also other squares generally. If, if the bishop can be on this diagonal, that would be amazing. But white's definitely going to like trade it off. He's not going to leave that bishop on that diagonal. He's not going to play something like bishop c2 after bishop a6. So knight e2. So knight's finally committed itself. And I thought, hold on, this, this is becoming a major threat now. This bishop takes a knight f4, if I'm not careful, with the potential also for e6. If the bishop ever left this diagonal, then e6 is going to find my way to... 
his way to my king if I'm not careful. I'm going to be blown to bits if I play a bit, bit too casually. So what I do now is actually play knight h4 to try and get the, the bishop exchanged off, then return back to f5. That was the idea. Nothing clever. I think he spent half an hour on this as I was going to play knight f3. That wasn't the intention at all. It was hoping he'd just castle. So I played bishop a6, get, get the light square bishops traded off, get my access to f5 again, without having to worry about bishop f5s, knight f4, queen f3, where these three pawns are all lined up to be victims. So, anyway, he plays g3, so knight f5, and he plays knight f4. And so I don't, I don't move the bishop, because I don't want bishop f5, I play g6. I don't really want to do this. Weaken some dark squares a bit more. Shouldn't really play this if you don't have to. Queen f3. So I, I reinforce my position now, c6. And I've got a cunning plan, believe it or not. Knight a6 to c7, then bishop a6. Because I really want to reinforce these two squares. And sort of, may, maybe later also, you know, there's possibilities for c4 for, for white if I'm not careful on this diagonal. So I'm re reinforcing d5, like with concrete. So, um h3, interesting move. So I play my plan, knight a6. According to, to Ribka, black's worse actually, but not by much here, especially after a4. I think it was indicating bishop e3 and not moving the a pawn at the moment. So knight c7, a5. And now black apparently is emerging with almost equality after this bishop exchange. So that's good news. So um, 0.18. So time to go go to sleep, isn't it? I've just I've just equalised. I've got rid of the venomous bishop, the most dangerous bishop in White's position, the light square bishop. So question for you: Do you go to sleep now that you've achieved this strategic objective? You've got the knight on f5. Can you just coast to a draw? Or would you try for a win? If you're going to try for a win, how would you do it from this position? Statistically, a lot of games are so often won with good knights. You see that in the King's Engine. A good knight on e4 often wins the game, statistically. Here, there's a nice knight on f5. The light square bishop exchanged off. Seemingly, this knight's in the passive position, like my other Quilling game. But, um, you know, there's a subtle point here. This, this is dynamic that c4 is going to be later an uncoiled strategic breakout. This is why I think, like, grandmasters like Nigel Short... You, you see them restraining the opponent's pawn structure on both sides of the board because they don't want any any strategic pawn breaks later on. I, I think they don't. They certainly don't label it as their opponent as being strategically crushed and, and leave the job as, as at that. So we'll see now. Maybe a bit of complacency did creep in because I, I thought I was coming up with a good plan now to block up the queen side with b5 with the idea, basically of queen d7, castling queen side, then rook g8, queen e8, g5. Now, in that is a hallucination that the queen on e8 is actually supporting h5, and I can't explain this. It's like a visualization problem I had. I, I don't get it. I don't know why I had that hallucination later, but it recurs. It's a mystery. So, anyway... Bishop e3, queen d7. And the point is, actually, that that's kind of important, that that hallucination uh, loses me tempo later on. But also, more fundamentally, is the question, isn't the king, like, safer over here? Like on g7 or something, if I castle in king g7? Because let's, for the moment, reconsider that I haven't played c5 and cd, and this strategic break c4 is going to happen. Now, if my king is over here, that is safer, surely, over here rather than here, if c4 is going to happen later. So this is quite long-distance planning from a seemingly very locked-up position on both sides of the board. But this is only a temporary situation, because this pawn hasn't been fixed by, by playing c takes d4 at some point. c5 is not being played. So anyway, I'm walking into a minefield here with my king, queen d7, and, and this silly hallucination as well, as if I'm going to get an attack quicker than, than um, in reality, it was much slower than what I imagined. So castles knight d2, king b8. I don't know, maybe it was... 
it was when I was visualising it much earlier that I had imagined Queen E8 and G5 without b noticing my pawns in the way. So B3, I, I, I just can't explain it, Queen E8. I really thought I was preparing G5. And I know it says, what, you know, what, what am I going on about? I don't know if it's like nerves or something. Something gets hold of me and I play like a complete idiot against some of these players some of the time. Um, and I, it's not as though, you know, this was a fast-paced game. When we were at move, like, eight, I think we were the slowest game in the tournament hole for the tournament. You know, we'd both spent, you know, quite a long time over, over our moves. Um, so anyway, after bishop D B2... Sorry, knight f1. I pretended as though I was just doing a waiting move to tease out c4 as if I was going to attack d4. So, okay, I didn't make a big deal out of just returning the queen back. And now I find 